to wear the red hand badge upon his manly breast. What scab obeys the royal command of Murphy? Show the badge with us. They dared to fling the manly brick. They wrecked the black leg tram. They dare give Harvey Duff a kick. They couldn't give a damn. They lie in jail and can't get bail. Who fought their corner those but true men like you? When I was young, I mean, the lockout was sort of part of Dublin working class culture. You know, everybody knew about it, everybody had some idea about it, and quite a lot of people knew a fair bit of what had happened. When the tram stopped on O'Connell Bridge in August of 1913, uh, my father said, OK, uh, we're on strike. And he led the men right out. He, he marched in front. They had the rest all marched out. I say men because I'm not certain at that stage whether there were, there were any women working in the Grand Canal Company. I never heard of them. So he walked out and they marched out after him. But uh, he'd walked up, he walked up Beckland Street, walked around the back of Guinness's and he did the picket there with, all, with the others. But as he told me, he said, you know what James, he said, as the months went by, you could see the you could see the the hunger in the people's faces, and they'd come up and say, "Jack, I need to go back to work." And uh, he said, "You know, we have to stay out. We have to be solid to, to Larkin." But at the back of his mind, he could see that they were suffering, particularly those with children. Most of the people would have been neighbours of his around around James Street, and. Um, so up the day went back, but he himself and one other waited outside until the last day. And then Jim Larkin marched up uh, at the back of Guinness's, came up and he said, Come here, he says, Come here, I have a word, I want to have a word with you, Jack. He said, now I'm calling off the strike. He said, Everybody goes back to work. And it was on a Friday. And uh, he went back then, and on Monday morning, he arrived back for his work at seven o'clock. And when he got to the, the door, now I found this is very poignant. He said, the gates had closed on him. And I stood with my hands on the bars of the gate, like a prisoner looking out of a cell. And I, then the superintendent of the yard came down and he said, well Fitzpatrick, he said, you've made your bed, you can lie on it now. You're a disruptive person, so we are not re-employing you, you're sight. We have material in the National Archives relating to the arrest of Jim Larkin in 1913, which is very interesting, the actual police record of all of that and the, the brief to, um, to uh, represent him. Um, and we would have the ordinary life, if you like, that was lived in Dublin at the time in 1913, represented in the Chief Secretary's Office papers, which shows you information about what was going on in the city of Dublin, where, of course, the big cataclysmic battle, if you like, took place. Yeah. Uh, we would have reports on Bloody Sunday in 1913, when the, the march was uh, attacked by the police force. Uh, and we would have material from the Bureau of Military History, which relates to 1913, because that's the year that the National Volunteers were formed. And we did a lot of work with Anu Productions, who Impact funded majorly to put on the tenement experience.
Banners Unfurled um, is an exhibition that we've hosted here for the last couple of weeks at the National Museum of Ireland. When we think about trade unionism in the 19th and 20th centuries, what we really think about is um, marches and protest meetings. And uh, at all those meetings, we're going to have seen banners. Uh, and that's what the exhibition is showing, is this example of those banners. There's two types of banners on, on display. We have um, the more older ones from the 19th century have been reproduced and photographed. Um, and then we have more modern ones from the various unions um, on display. So it kind of balances out showing almost 150 years of the different types of banners that would have been used in, in Ireland. Exhibition has been very, very popular. It's um, uh, people have been coming in and uh, they like just the way they've been used in the space. We've had them hanging from the roof um, and people have been able to move through them uh, and to touch and feel them. So people like that kind of effect of being involved with the exhibition uh, and they really, really enjoyed it. So we're looking forward to leaving here and, and traveling around the country and going to other, other sites. A few years ago, Impact put up some of the sponsorship to help make this happen. It's Porrick Yates' book on the lockout, uh, and it's the definitive work. If you only have a chance to read one thing, this is the book you should read. But at 670 pages, it's a big book for a big story. So if you don't have time for that, maybe you should try this. The magnificent banner wrapped around Liberty Hall, the messaging on that was about decent work and fairness in society. Probably the most, the single most impressive, certainly the most impressive visual impact of the lockout. No one who was in Dublin could avoid seeing it if you're in the city centre at all. We wanted to um, mark in a respectful way a very important um, anniversary for the trade union movement, the most important industrial dispute that has taken place in the last hundred years. We also wanted to use the opportunity to, um, I suppose, create create greater awareness and understanding about our core values and what it is that we're trying to achieve. The most important activity of the entire year, there's no doubt about this, was our school's project. And it probably isn't something that you can see. It, there isn't a kind of a great picture out there. It's not something you pass by. But um, the school's project has been delivered to over 430 schools in this academic year. So more than half the secondary schools in the country um, have had a visit from one of our school's um, offices and they have participated in the Decent Work um, project. It's bringing the message of trade unionism to young audiences that don't naturally um, get it or have access to information about trade unions. That project would not have happened if it wasn't for impact actually seeing how important this project is and putting up the funding, the initial funding a few years ago that made it possible. My highlight of the Centennial events would have to be the tenement experience. Uh, I got to see it on a number of occasions and every time it absolutely thrilled me. I, it, was, it was just so astonishingly moving uh, to see those two young men who were brothers finally falling out over the need to go back to work on the part of one of them because his children were starving. Really, what does this say? I will not join as a poor Danny Union. I know what I saw in China. You don't have to read it out to me. You should be ashamed of yourself, you know that? Laura Murray, wonderful actress, is, is playing the wife of one of the, the lockout victims. Um, and she's in the room with her two children with just a bed. And she's meditating on what the hell is she going to do now? I'm probably going to have to sell the bed because we've nothing else and, and he can't go back to work. And on three occasions, somebody in the audience said, don't worry, love, I'll buy the bed. Now listen, I wouldn't normally do this now. And I'm terrible, terrible sorry for that, asking you. But would you think now that any of you might be in a position to give me something for it? That, that house had never been anything since about the late 19th century, except the tenement. We had the building, thanks to Charles Duggan, who was one of the unsung heroes of the, of the year, and of the city. So it's thanks largely to him that we had a building. Um, we worked with the uh, Heritage Trust and with the city, uh, but the core group that made it happen were Annu Productions, Louise Lowe and Owen Boss. And Owen Boss is actually a, a grandson of P.T. Daly. Really, would you sign that? It's over, Charlie! It's not over. 
It can't be over. Thank <music> you.